All right, last week we talked about Mary finding favor with God and um, being chosen by God to give birth to the Son of God. Tonight, we're going to talk about what exactly does finding favor with God mean in this world. It was said of others, and uh, what came of them as a result of their finding favor. Well, of course, going back to Wednesday's lesson, or Sunday's lesson, rather, 26 to 30, we're going to look at that much of it. In the sixth month, that's the sixth month of Elizabeth, Mary's cousin's pregnancy. Six months after the same angel appeared to Zachariah's uh, Elizabeth's husband and told him that his wife, six months after, was going to give birth. And now six months later, his wife, who was barren and now old, having gone through the change in life, twice impossible to have a child, now she's six months pregnant, and that same angel now comes to talk to Mary. And um, when he shows up, it said in verse 27, he come to Galilee to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among woman, women. And again, in the Greek, we covered this Sunday morning, highly favored means endued with grace. God has graced you, Mary. Now, Romans 4, 16. Was Mary highly favored because she was perfect, or at least very, very good? In Romans 4, 16, Paul writes to the church at Rome and said, therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed. And that's uh, a hard. different, that's the King James, I mean, that's the NIV. Well, that will be the same way, the same one. Them are the exact words of what's on the wall there. The first half of verse 16. Therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed. What's that mean? It means when you and I put our faith in God, now the issue is no longer how do we get to heaven. The issue is now God working in us to a guaranteed result. And the reason it's now guaranteed when it's by grace is it no longer depends on me. If it depends on me, my salvation can never be guaranteed. It's all going to be a luck of the draw. I'm going to be saved now, lost tomorrow when I sin, saved Wednesday. Oh, wait, this is Wednesday. Saved Friday again, lost Saturday. Uh, it all depends on when the trumpet sounds, whether or not I'll go to heaven. God doesn't like that equation, so he took it out of my hands and put it in his. And that's what faith does. I put my trust in Jesus. He counts that as righteousness. Or in other words, he counts it as though I am now right with God, not because of what I've done, but because of what I've believed. And so the promise is now guaranteed. And so in verse 29, I, I put that there to say, no, Mary didn't get chosen of God because she was better than all the other women. She was favored or picked by God because of grace. God in Ephesians 1 according to the good purpose of his will God from an eternity past chose Mary to be the mother of Jesus it had nothing to do with Mary it had everything to do with God and uh, now in verse 29 and when she saw him when Mary saw the angel she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be in verse 30 and the angel said unto her Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Again, uh, Mary found favor. Uh, the remainder of his life, her life must have been blessed. It all depends on how you define blessed. Mary found favor with God. How did that affect her life? 
Look at Genesis 6 down below. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. And the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also his flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Now, that could mean one of two things. Um, and the second of those two is what most commentators believe it means. Moses, I mean Noah's grandfather, our great-grandfather, I'd have, I'd have to go back and check. I think it was his grandfather. We have 969 years. God created these human bodies perfect, and when sin came in, they were created to live forever. And when sin came in, aging began. There was no aging until they ate of that fruit. When aging began, that means the seed of death was now in place. At some point, the body would be old enough where it could no longer function and die. And the perfect bodies at first lived a very long time, hundreds of years. And then gradually they were far enough removed from creation that the lifespan grew less and less until you were where we're at today, we're amazed when somebody makes a hundred years old. So everything is different now than it was. So some would argue that my spirit shall not always strive with men, and then he mentioned, uh, God mentioned 120 years. Some would mean he was gonna make the aging of man more rapid, that they were gonna enter a new time uh, when people lived 120 or so years in that, uh, that vicinity somewhere. Others would say, no, no, that's the 120 years of a lot of time for the world to continue to exist in a sinful state after he spoke to Noah. In other words, that's where some people get the idea that it took 120 years to build the ark. So there were the two possibilities. There's some truth to both of them. Dying became younger and younger and younger in the Old Testament. And again, when I was a teenager, the average age of a man who died was 63. And the average age of a woman was 65. That's why FDR thought he came up with the perfect solution. Well, I mean, not welfare. Social Security at age 65. Most people wouldn't live to use it, but they could collect from the worker. But then, medical science kept inventing more and more ways to keep us alive. And now, you can still retire at 65. Now, the next group, I think, is going to have to be 68. Uh, to get full benefit, and it'll gradually go up. But people are living the average ages into the 70s now, mid-70s, mid it's not unusual. Daryl's uh, 82, 81. 81. 81, under and he's under shooting for 100. <laughs> he's on his way to 100. On this, this month. Pardon me? On the 17th of this month, I'll be 81. Oh, this much? You're not quite there yet. Not quite. You know that so guy? Was you know that guy at IV that's around nine, close to a hundred? No, I don't know. Uh, I've seen people, but um, yeah, I've, I've known a couple. Nine, I did a wedding for, nine, nine, I forget, uh, Audrey's mother, I think. And I think the guy, she was in her 90s. The guy she married was uh, about a hundred years old. Remember that couple? Uh, the organ player in the old chain. Uh, so I did a wedding. I've done funerals for people that have lived over 100. But that's still somewhat rare. Fitch. But even with all the medical advancements, it's still somewhat name? rare. Fitch. But the point is, God was upset with all the sin and had it up to here. 
And again, when God adds it up to here, it's not like you and I when we have it up to here. When we have it up to here, we blow our stack. God doesn't blow a stack ever. Everything is well thought out and well planned. And God knew it was time to start over with Noah. And so, what does it say about Noah? Something very similar to what it says about Mary. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How'd that work out for us? Let's use the number 120 uh, that we read about as 120 years of building the ark before the rain came. The New Testament, in one of the Peters, I forget if it's first or second Peter right now, uh, talks about Noah being a preacher of righteousness. This man built an ark by the day and preached by night. For 120 years, he warned people about what God was doing. He preached righteousness, repent and live right type stuff. And that 120 years, he had exactly zero converts. I tell you, since I moved to this town, we started with a congregation, an average congregation at Full Gospel of 200 on Sunday mornings. Six years later when we left, it was an average congregation of 300 on Sunday mornings. We left there, started a church with about 30 people, and that church, Good News Worship Center, grew uh, to 100 and some uh, on average on Sunday mornings. And then there was an issue when, when a man and a woman who were already married decided they wanted to marry each other. Uh, and the church took sides, which they should have never done. It's a very simple thing. The two people that are leaving their current mates to marry each other are sinning, pure and simple. They're still married, and they're planning on marrying each other. But some people, because people get confused by who they like the most, had issues with that. They didn't like me saying, let's pray for so-and-so, the man who was left by his wife, said, why are we always praying for him? How about his wife? And to me it was, uh, there are certain things to me that are black and white. Doesn't matter what kind of marriage they had, if the marriage was failing, none of that matters. A married man took another man's wife. That's sin. Now you can do other things. You can both divorce, separate from your mates, and then start dating. <coughs> and uh, you say, well, what's the difference there? Well, the difference is propriety. You're not dating another person's husband or wife now. But nonetheless, our church started shrinking from that day on. And um, when we moved over here, we had about 40. And um, there are times when I look out right now on a Sunday morning, if we hit 20, we want to throw a rodeo. Uh, throw a rodeo? Can you throw a rodeo? <laughs> I suppose if the bets are in, you can throw it. Uh, but we want to uh, throw a party might be a better statement. But the point I'm getting at is <coughs> I don't dwell on it. I don't, I get discouraged. I don't dwell on discouragement. It takes too much energy. Mm -hmm. I am too lazy to walk around discouraged. That's exhausting. But I get discouraged. Can you imagine Noah, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, building all day, walking into town and preaching in the evening before he goes to bed, and not getting a single convert? And, uh, you know, I have notes there you can read. I'm kind of cutting through it. But what I want you to see is this. 
He found grace in the eyes of the Lord and his life was tough. Working all day, let's just say for 120 years. Again, there are commentators who don't believe that the 120 years means that's how long before the rain started falling. But if it wasn't, it was 90, somewhere between 97 and 120 years. That's a long time to build. That's a long time. That he was uh, about 500 years old when, when he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Well, in his reality, in God's reality, before there was ever a universe, no one found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God had always known he would call Noah at that time. But in our reality, which is the only thing we can envision, Noah was around 500 years old when God called him. Building, now again, his grandpa lived to be over 900, so you couldn't necessarily say Noah was a very, very old man. People were living a long time at that time. Life expectancy started going down after the flood. And uh, obviously by the time you get to New Testament, they're way, way down. And um, when you get to the 1960s and 70s in America, they're way down in the 60s. Uh, now they're going the other way. And uh, I, I tell you, I read an article and heard him talk about it on the radio one time. <clears throat> they're talking about having these microscopic robots that they can shoot into your blood. They haven't quite got it perfected yet. Those things that float around in your blood detect any disease in there and kill it. Paul Harvey talked about it one time when he was alive. That's how long they've been playing with this idea. And uh, he said they wouldn't be surprised if they get this perfected if people could live to be a thousand. Hurry up, guys. Uh, <laughs> Hurry up. But nonetheless, what's my point here? When all this wraps up after the tribulation, and we enter into the millennial reign, the Bible said that if you die before you're 100, they'll think you were just a child. Tells me that life expectancy is going to shoot way, way up. And when I hear stuff like that, my ears perk up and say, maybe we're just on the verge of life, life inspected the shooting. And just think, if we start to live till a thousand, what, you could retire at 650 years old. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not sure what you call that grace. My point is Noah's finding grace in the eyes of the Lord. He had a rough life. Very rough life. Let's look at Mary. Let's go back to Mary in the middle of the backside there, uh, page 4. Verses 18 and 19. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came, came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. That's what the word privately there means and the way we talk, privately. He loved the woman so much, but um, you know, if a pregnant, the woman you're engaged to marry comes to you and tells you she's pregnant, but it's okay because it's a miracle baby from God. The chances of any man on this planet believing that are exactly zero percent. And that might not be strong enough. It might be a negative percentage. And no way Joseph would believe the story Mary had told her. And so as we'll find out next week, an angel had to come and talk to Joseph about it as well so that he would understand uh, that uh, the veracity in what Mary was telling him. But in the meantime, he's deeply in love with this woman and thinks that she has cheated on him. And he wants, in those days, when you were engaged, they called it in spouse. You were in spouse to somebody. It was a legal document where you needed a writ of divorcement to break it. 
Now people can be engaged, turn around, give the ring back, and it's over in our, in our world. That's not the way it was in Israel at this time. You needed to get the priest involved. You needed to break this engagement. And Joseph wanted to find a quiet way to do it because even though he felt cheated on by Mary, he wanted to protect her because he loved her so much. So what's the first price Mary paid for finding favor in the eyes of the Lord? Her stomach's getting bigger and she doesn't have a husband. She's a teenage girl who is becoming more and more pronounced in her pregnancy without a husband. Today, no big deal in America. My mother, I don't even know who my dad was. My mother got pregnant by some man in 1947, probably around the middle, let's say I was born in April of uh, 48. So probably that four months, July, August of 47, she was pregnant. She was pregnant at a time it was not good to be pregnant when you didn't have a husband. She had had two. Her first husband, she had three children by him. One day he got up, got on his motorcycle and rode away and that was that. And then he married, she married a, a man with my last name. His name was James Hanna, my brother is a junior. His name is James Hanna. We never met him, but um, because my mom had to hide the shame of being pregnant without a husband, the story became, and it was passed on to me as a teenager from my grandma, that her ex-husband from Florida drove all the way out there trying to give my mom to go another round and try this marriage again. And while he was up there, um, she got pregnant by him. See, that's not such a big thing because they had been married and they're trying to renew their marriage was a story. But that turned out to be a story that in the 40s hid your shame, but it simply wasn't true. All of that pales in comparison to the time Mary lived you did not get pregnant without a husband. It was possible you could have been stoned to death for fornication. Mary found favor in the eyes of the Lord. She could have run into a host of people who wanted to stone her as a result of it. This woman who was favored of the Lord, graced by God, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The man she loved no longer wanted to marry her. See, we get this idea that, man, God, I, I'd love to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Everything would go good from here on out. Really, that's Noah about that. That's Mary about that. Finding favor with God has absolutely nothing to do with how the rest of your life is going to play out. All that it will do is let you know as your life plays out, however difficult it might be, you know God's on your side because you found grace in His eyes. That's all it means, and that's a lot. We understand here it's a lot, but when people are walking by with stones, wondering if they ought to start throwing them at you, maybe it doesn't seem so much. The Apostle Paul, God graced him and doesn't word it the same in the New Testament story. It doesn't say Paul found grace within the eyes of the Lord, but he was out persecuting the church as a good Pharisee, arresting people, 
bringing them in change to Jerusalem from the church. One day he's on his road, the road to Damascus, and God knocks him off his donkey. And a bright light that only he sees, the men with him don't see the bright light. But it knocks him on the ground and blinds him. And he hears a voice, and it appears the others heard it, but they didn't make out the words. Paul did. Jesus spoke to him out of that bright light, Paul, Paul, it is hard to kick against the pricks. You're fighting the wrong battle, Paul. You're a fighter, I'll give you a battle to fight. They helped him back on his donkey. He was blind. He went to a town and God told him to wait there until a guy named, a disciple named Ananias. There was two of them in the book of Acts. The other was married to Sapphira. This is not that Ananias. Those two were struck dead by God for uh, lying about some things uh, regarding their giving, their financial giving. I, I don't want to go into that tonight. This was a different Ananias. And this Ananias was a man of God, and God said, you wait right here. He's going to come and pray for you, and I'm going to give you your sight back. And sure enough, that happened. And so here was a Christian sent by God to pray for a man that was persecuting the church. All these people that God gave grace to. Paul had papers from Jerusalem. He could have got his sight back and arrested that guy. But that guy did exactly what God told him to do. And Paul got his sight back. And then a very famous guy from the book of Acts named Barnabas, whose name means con consoler. He can, uh, and, and he truly was. He consoled. He always looked for the good in folk. After the first missionary journey, Paul had it up to here with John Mark. Barnabas said, whenever getting ready for a second journey, let's take him. He left real quick during the first journey. Paul had no time for quitters. This man of God had no time. You say you're gonna do this for God, you do it. John Mark went home. The, the journey started on an island, and then they went into Europe. From that island, when they got to uh, solid ground, John Mark said, I'm going home. And so Paul and Barnabas finished the rest of that first missionary journey. They go back, report all the good news. After a while, they say, let's go back and check on all those churches we started. And Barnabas said, great, let's take John Mark with it. Paul said, I'm not taking John Mark with it. But Barnabas, the consoler, said, yeah, yeah, he, he's learned his lesson. He'll do well. Godly people don't always act like godly people. I don't care how godly they are. The dispute between Paul and Barnabas became so strong, they broke their relationship. Barnabas didn't go with Paul on Paul's second missionary journey. Sign was dead. Barnabas went another way. I forget to hit partner that he chose a, uh, another Christian to be partners with him. But Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, was a companion of Paul who traveled along with Paul. So the rest of the story of the book of Acts just talks about Paul and Silas missionary journeys two and three. We don't read about what happened in Barnabas' second missionary journey. But I read and I bring all that up. I want to show you something. When Barnabas was on death row in Rome, he wrote a letter to Timothy. In 2 Timothy, the last epistle he ever writes, he said, come and see me and bring with you John Mark. That's the one he fought over way back then. The one he wanted nothing to do with way back then. Paul said, bring him with you for he is profitable to me in the ministry. You say, why do you bring that up? The great man of God, Paul, was wrong. Barnabas was right. The consoler that went to Paul when Paul was a young Christian 
and took him under his wing and introduced him to the disciples. That consoler looked out for John Mark. Who knows what would have happened to him had it not been for Barnabas. But he became profitable in the ministry and Paul began to recognize it. My point in all this is read Paul's story, read Mary's story, read Noah's story. Being graced by God does not mean everything's going to be rosy, you're going to win a new lottery every week. That'd be nice. 150 million, but after a while, you'd have to start over at 40 million. They wouldn't be very big jackpots. Who wants to win those? But my, you know, I got news for you, whether you know it or not. You are graced by the Lord. You found grace in the eyes of the Lord. As surely as Noah did, as surely as Mary did. And you can testify that doesn't mean everything in your life has always been great. You went through trials, and you know what Jesus says to encourage you? As long as you're in this world, you'll have trouble. Are you encouraged yet? That's a guarantee from Jesus himself. So it's a wonderful story that Mary found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but not only did she face those things that I told you about? But ultimately, she seen her son arrested, beaten to a pulp in Pilate's Judgment Hall, bleeding everywhere. She seen him struggling to drag a wooden cross up a hill until he physically could no longer do it and they had to grab someone from the onlookers to help him. And she stood at the foot of the cross and watched him die. That's sometimes what it means to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. But you know the really good news? Three days later, she seen the resurrected son. So there's heartache in life no matter who we are. If you're an enemy of God, you're gonna suffer heartache. If you're a friend of God, you're gonna suffer heartache. But the good news is when you find grace in the eyes of the Lord, getting to heaven's no longer in your hands. It's in his hands, and it guarantees the result.